In this video, I'm going to talk about a system that comes up a lot in thermodynamics. And that system is a piston. And a piston can undergo compression or expansion. So inside the piston, there's actually a gas. And that's what's doing the expanding or the compressing. So we're going to talk about quasi-static compression and expansion. Now, quasi-static means that all the relevant macroscopic quantities are defined throughout the entire duration of the process. So there's no abrupt jumps where the pressure or the temperature or the volume are undefined. That means that if you have a pressure or a volume or a temperature and you assign it to that gas, every point inside that gas has that attribute. It has that quantity associated with it. So it's evenly distributed throughout the entire gas. You can treat the gas as one big clump. So every clump of the gas is identical. Now we know that this isn't actually 100% true, but for macroscopic purposes, this approximation gets us very far. So that's what quasi-static means. Quasi-static means that it's almost static. It's almost as if nothing's changing, but it's just changing slowly so that all of these relevant macroscopic quantities are defined and there's no abrupt jumps. So that's what this quasi-static means. Compression and expansion are fairly intuitive ideas. If you compress a gas, you're decreasing its volume and you're adding energy to it. If, you, if a gas expands and pushes against the surroundings, then it's losing energy because it takes energy to expand, and its volume is increasing. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the quantity of work. How does work change, and how do we actually calculate work for a piston containing some kind of gas? So first of all, let's have a look at the definition of work. So a tiny amount of work, let's call that W. So this is a little bit of work that is done during a process. How can we define that? Well, what you need is a force vector, and you need a tiny little displacement vector. So dr is a three-dimensional vector that points in the direction of displacement. So if you have a tiny little nudge in the r direction, and you have a tiny force, or it doesn't necessarily have to be tiny, this can be just any force applied, what you have to do is you have to take the dot product of those two vectors. If those two vectors are parallel, then the dot product is the same as the magnitudes multiplied together. And that's actually what we've done over here. Because if you just have f times delta x, these guys are the magnitudes of this force f and this tiny displacement dr. So why are these guys parallel? Well, in this diagram of the piston, you can see if the piston moves down or it moves up, that is the same direction as the force being applied. Right? The force is either applied this way or the gas is applying a force this way. And that is parallel to the direction of delta x. Right? It's parallel to where the displacement is occurring. So the displacement is either up or down, and the force is either up or down. So that means their product, uh, or the, the product of their scalars, is exactly the same as the dot product. So the dot product takes two vector quantities, and it gives us a scalar. And the dot product of the force and the displacement, that gives us the work. So the units of this are newtons, and the units of this are meters or that's in SI units. This is units of force, this is units of distance, or Newton meters. And Newton meters are the same as joules, and joules are the SI unit for energy. So work is a form of energy. So here we have energy, force, and displacement. So force times displacement gives us work. That's what this means over here. And keep in mind, how can we go from here to here? Well, these guys are both parallel to each other, and that means we can just take their magnitudes and take the product of those magnitudes, and that gives us the work. So why are we concerned with the little dr? Why isn't it a, a big chunk, a big displacement? Well, it's because we're talking about adding up tiny little chunks. And so we're taking the limit as these little drs go to 0, so that we can actually integrate over an entire process. Right? We want to take the cumulative effects of these tiny little nudges all throughout space all throughout the entire trajectory in 3D space. But luckily for us, this piston uh, is a one-dimensional problem, because these guys are both parallel, and they're only moving along one dimension. That's a very convenient situation. Another relevant quantity that we actually need is pressure. Pressure is defined as force per unit area. right? So force is in newtons for the SI unit system. Uh, the area is in meters squared. right? Length squared, that is area. So that's what we have over here. And this guy is in pascals, or newtons per meters squared. So that's the SI units for all of these guys. 
we can actually rearrange this expression by multiplying both sides by the area, and we can get that the force is the pressure times the area. In this diagram, the force is shown acting on this over here, on this piston. So the piston was originally at this dotted line, and now it's at this full line over here. So it's moved down a distance delta x. So what you can actually say is that the work done is the product of these two things. It's the force times the delta x. And this specific scenario is for compression. It's being compressed because delta v is going down. So the volume is decreasing. And if it's decreasing, it's negative. So we can say that the delta v, the change in volume, is minus the area of this piston times delta x. What are the units of this delta v? They are length cubed or in SI units, meters cubed. This is length squared, and this is length. So we have length squared times length, that gives us length cubed. So we have length cubed on both of the sides of this equation. So the, the units work out. And this minus sign is here by convention because we're taking compression. We're doing compression, right? This thing is going down, it's decreasing. There's a compression process. So delta x is going in the downwards direction, right? It's, it's decreasing. So what we actually have to think about this is this is a coordinate. This is x. This coordinate corresponds to the height. And this a corresponds to the cross-sectional area. This is just a 2D slice of the piston, really, right? Because it could, the piston could be any sort of shape. It could be circular. It could be rectangular. It could be elliptical. It could be any funky shape. All we need is the cross-sectional area. And that is given by a. And that actually doesn't change. As you move the piston down or up, that cross-sectional area stays the same. So all you have to do is multiply by the change in height, and that's going to give you the change in volume. So this is not the entire volume that's enclosed here. This is just a tiny little change. So you can think of this over here. All of this is V, or the volume. And this little section over here, this little slice, that is delta V. So that's just a little slice in that infinitesimal change in x. So that tiny change of x causes a tiny change in the volume. And what we can actually do is we can rearrange this expression by dividing both sides by negative of the area. And we get this. So the units of this side are length. The units of this side are length cubed divided by length squared. And length cubed divided by length squared, that gives us length overall. So this over here is, again, a negative quantity by convention. Because the delta V is negative, it's decreasing. The volume goes down in compression, right? because you're squeezing it, and it's it's taking up less space as a result. So what we can do now is we can take this expression for work, which is force times delta x, and we can substitute these two expressions for f and delta x. The force we know is pressure times area. And pressure times area, we can substitute over here. And then delta x, that's this guy, delta x is minus delta v on a. We can substitute that into here as well. And what you can notice is that the area doesn't even matter. The area can be anything. So the area just cancels out. That's, that's the reasoning behind that. If the area cancels out, it doesn't actually influence the work in the end. So the only things that actually influence the work are the pressure and the change in volume. And this minus sign is preserved. This minus sign stays over here because that's our convention for compression. So why does the area cancel? Why would the work not depend on the, the, the area? Well, it's because this. Uh, doesn't necessarily depend on how big the piston is. The only thing it depends on is how much pressure you're applying. So the thing that it actually depends on is the force per unit area, not the area and not the force, right? Because this is an entire piston. We don't care about the force and we don't care about the area. What we care about is the force per unit area because we're concerned with the change in volume. We're not concerned with the displacement. If we were concerned with the displacement, then we'd be interested in the force. But we're just concerned with the volume and the pressure. So this over here, the work uh, in a tiny little nudge of a piston is negative P delta V. That is what we essentially have in this scenario. So that is the quasi-static work. So let's have a quick look at this minus sign. What does this minus sign mean? This minus sign tells us that a positive change in delta V gives us a negative work. And a negative change in delta v gives us negative times negative, which is positive work. Why is that the case? In a positive delta v, that is ex expansion, right? Expansion is associated with a positive delta v. 
because it's increasing in size. So if this is positive, we're actually losing energy because the gas is doing work on the surroundings. So its internal energy is decreasing. So that means this work will be negative for expansion. But the work is positive when there is compression, because when you compress the gas, you actually give it more energy. So this value will be negative. Negative multiplied by negative gives a positive value. And finally, I just want to talk about the units of this. The units of work are joules. It's energy, right? This is joules. This over here, this is newtons per meter squared. Or you can think of it as uh, units of force per unit area, right? Force per unit area. And this is unit of, this, this unit is volume, right? That's length cubed. So implicitly what we have here is force per length squared because length squared is area and length cubed is volume. So if you multiply uh, force per length squared by length cubed, it's only going to leave one length, right? Because length cubed over length squared, as we saw up here, just leaves length. So it's a unit of length which is meters for SI units. So this over here is going to leave us with force times displacement. It's exactly the same units as before, Newton meters. And Newton meters, that's the same as joules. So the units work out. So the thing to take away from this video is that the work done in a quasi-static process, that's either compression or expansion, that type of work situation is given by this. A tiny amount of work is due to a tiny change in volume multiplied by the pressure. And we add in a minus sign by convention.